Okay, so this time we're going to talk about the Krebs cycle, and for whatever reason, it's not letting me open the Krebs diagram in Vimeo, but that's okay. We'll we'll just do it. So we had our pyruvate. We went through our pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, and we got ourselves a molecule of acetyl-CoA. Now we're ready to kick off the Krebs cycle. So let's talk about what's happening with with this. To kick off the Krebs cycle, we have a molecule that's both a product and a reactant. That molecule happens to be oxaloacetate. If I don't have a molecule that's both a product and a reactant, I don't have a cycle. I don't have a loop to close. So the oxaloacetate reacts with acetyl-CoA, makes me a molecule of citrate. Citrate synthase was my regulatory enzyme that did that. So I need to know my regulatory enzymes, and that's one of them, regulated by energy. Now I'm going to rearrange my citrate, but I'm, I don't know if rearrange was the best word. What I'm going to do is I'm going to convert my citrate to isocitrate, but I'm doing it by taking a water off and putting it back on. So what I'm really doing is taking the hydrogen and the hydroxyl off, flip-flopping them, putting them back on, so I'm actually moving the hydroxyl from one carbon to another. That's why your enzyme is not a mutase, but it's also not regulatory. This is a reversible reaction. Now I'm going to take the isocitrate. I'm going to oxidize it and decarboxylate it. So I'm going to convert it to alpha-ketoglutarate. I'm going to decarboxylate it. So there's a carbon dioxide coming off. I'm going to oxidize it. So there's an NAD going to NADH. The NADH is important. That's a product of the Krebs cycle. It's an ATP equivalent. It's an electron carrier loaded up with electrons. It's something that can go and give me ATP now. So this is a regulatory step regulated, of course, by isocitrate dehydrogenase. Now I'm going to do exactly the same thing almost again. I'm going to take alpha-ketoglutarate to succinyl-CoA. Well, how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to decarboxylate it. I'm going to oxidize NAD to NADH, or I'm sorry, reduce NAD to NADH while I oxidize the alpha-ketoglutarate to succinyl-CoA. I'm also going to put a CoA on that I'll take off in the next step. Alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase is my regulatory enzyme when I'm doing that. So that's my regulatory enzyme that does, does this step. So now I've got myself a molecule of succinyl-CoA. So I have a succinyl-CoA and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep on going. I'm halfway through the Krebs cycle. So now I'm going to take my succinyl-CoA and I'm going to go to succinate. So I'm going to succinate. And when I go to succinate, I'm doing a substrate level. That was a pretty bad arrow. Let me try that again. Substrate level phosphorylate, phosphorylation of GDP to GTP. So now I'm getting a GTP. More energy out of this molecule. And this is a reversible step. So my only irreversible steps are making my citrate, making my alpha-ketoglutarate, and making my succinyl-CoA. Everything else is reversible. So I've got my succinate now. I'm going to go to fumarate. I've got energy when I do that. So I'm... That's an oxidation. I'm going to reduce FAD to FADH2 as I do this. 
another ATP equivalent. Now I'm going to hydrate my fumarate to malate. Hydrate. Oh, water is going in. Watch out with your mnemonic with that. Water is going in, not out. It's a reactant, not a product. That can mess you up with, with the mnemonic. So now I'm going to oxidize oxaloacetate to malate while I reduce NAD to NADH. So here's my products of the Krebs cycle in terms of energy. NADH, NADH, GTP, FADH2, and NADH. That water that we made is not a product. So be careful there. One of the most popular mnemonics has it going in as a, or has it coming out as a product. So let's talk about this for a second. So I'm going in a circle. I'm going in a cycle. What did I accomplish? Going in a circle usually accomplishes you nothing. So let's clarify that because this clarification is one of the biggest aha moments of the Krebs cycle. So I started with oxaloacetate and I ended with oxaloacetate. So that's your really common question, you know, which of the following is both a product and a reactant. But that oxaloacetate's a very low energy molecule. So let's think about what we did. We had a bunch of energy and glucose, went through some steps, ended up with pyruvate. Decent amount of energy in each of those because all we got off was two ATP and two NADHs. So there's still a decent amount of energy in those pyruvates. They went to acetyl-CoA and a couple NADHs came off on the way. So we've still got a decent amount of energy in acetyl-CoA. So that acetyl-CoA is sitting there with a decent amount of energy in it. So I want the energy out of that acetyl-CoA to be able to make ATP out of it, replace the energy of that high energy phosphate bond and make myself some ATP. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to citrate. Citrate still has a bunch of energy in it. Haven't really taken anything off. Now I'll go to isocitrate. Still lots of energy in it. But when I go to alpha ketoglutarate, I'm taking a little bit of energy off in the form of that NADH. So I took a little off. Alpha ketoglutarate still has a lot of energy, but not as much as we started with because a little bit came off. Now going to succinyl-CoA took a little bit more off. So succinyl-CoA still has a decent amount, but not as much as we started with, not as much as alpha ketoglutarate because some came off. Succinyl-CoA to succinate, a little more off in the form of GTP. Succinate to fumarate, a little more off in the form of that FADH2. Going to malate, no change. Going back to oxaloacetate, that low energy molecule, we take the last little bit off. So all that energy that came in with, on, I'm not sure what the best word is, whatever with that acetyl-CoA came off as the things that we write when we write this is kind of the by the ways. We make a big deal because of the multiple choice world you live in and the way questions are asked. We make a big deal out of citrate makes isocitrate, makes alpha ketoglutarate, makes succinyl-CoA, makes succinate, makes fumarate, makes malate, makes oxaloacetate. And I'm not negating at all that you'll have to know that. Those are nice, easy questions to ask. So of course, absolutely fair game. That's where we tend to put our attention, forgetting that our attention really should be on, you know, this stuff. That's what's going to make us ATP. That's what's satisfying the point of the process. That's the energy that's going to go to, to electron transport. Well, that's how the energy is going to get to the electron transport chain so that we can make ATP out of it. So that's kind of the big aha moment of, of this and putting it all together. You know, why are we going in a circle? How are we accomplishing anything going in a circle? 
And that's how we're accomplishing something going in a circle. So anyway, you have to know what makes what. Have to know what do I make, these three NADHs, the FADH2 and the GTP. Have to know um, that they'll ultimately give you ATP. Have to know the regulatory enzymes. They're regulated by energy. Pretty easy there. The other thing that you have to know is a one more enzyme deal. The enzyme that takes my succinate to fumarate is succinate dehydrogenase. Whether it's regulatory, you can argue a little bit. Some books call it regulatory, some don't. It's not regulatory in the sense that we typically talk about, as in it's an allosteric enzyme with something that turns it on or off, activates or inhibits it. It's also, remember, complex two of the electron transport chain. So it is the physical, literal link between the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain or between the Krebs cycle and the inner mitochondrial membrane, two ways of saying really the same thing. That's a really common thing to get asked. As far as being regulatory or not, I would call it my on-the-fence enzyme. I won't put you in this position. I'm not going to ask if it's regulatory. But we talked about how you might get presented with a question that would make you call it regulatory or not regulatory. So remember that when you're ask, answering questions on this. I will absolutely ask you what enzyme connects Krebs to electron transport, Krebs to the inner mitochondrial membrane. So I, I would definitely know that about the Krebs cycle. Okay, so we did the Krebs cycle. Got this stuff, NADH, FADH2, GTP. Now what do we do with it? Well, the GTP will become an ATP, but everything else we're going to send to the electron transport chain. So when we were talking about the electron transport chain, we started out very conceptual. We said we have the mitochondria. We've got an outer mitochondrial membrane. We've got an inner membrane, all wrinkled up membrane. And in between it, we have an intermembrane space. When you see a wrinkled membrane like that, think surface area, it's containing the matrix, mitochondrial matrix, and pretty much everything we're ever going to be looking for is in that matrix. We've got ADP, we've got ATP, NAD, NADH, FAD, so on, so on, so on. Everything's in there. So if you're not sure where something is and you get asked and you need kind of, you know, a Hail Mary answer, you're just having a total brain cramp, where is it? If you get the opportunity to pick the matrix, you're probably in good shape with that answer. So as a result of having these two membranes, what I have is like two contained spaces. So here's how electron transport works. I have protein complexes embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane. They're going to transport electrons, hence the name. So they're going to transport electrons. So what do you think is a good way to transport electrons? How about oxidation and reduction? Oxidation is losing an electron. Reduction is gaining an electron. So if I oxidize, reduce, oxidize, reduce, I can hand off electrons. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take, say, NADH. I'm going to feed it into a protein complex. So what I mean by that is I'm going to oxidize NADH back to NAD. I'm going to give the electron to the protein complex. I'm going to reduce it. Then I'm going to oxidize it while I reduce the next one. Then I'll oxidize that one while I reduce the next one. And so on. So I'm going to hand electrons down the chain. So the analogy we used in class was this. You were sitting up in the middle of the back row, the real nosebleed section up there. You were sitting up there and you were absolutely starving. So you got on your little Domino's app and ordered a pizza. 
So you ordered the pizza. The pizza guy came to the door, and you were just too weak with hunger to get up and get your pizza. So he handed the pizza to me, and I handed it to the guy at the end of the first row, handed it to, handed it to somebody else, and so on. And we eventually handed it up to you. So by the time you got it, you had this cold, soggy pizza. So you had this cold, soggy pizza. So what had the pizza actually done on the way to you? It had lost energy. So where did the energy go? It went into the room. We raised the temperature of the room, you know, 0.1 degree or whatever that's not noticeable. But, but yes, yeah, so that's where the energy went. So it's the same idea here. The electrons are moving down this chain. And by the time they keep going, you know, there's not much energy left. They're a cold, soggy pizza. Oh, where's the energy going? The energy is going into the intermembrane space in the form of protons. So we're putting protons into that intermembrane space. So we use the analogy then of a battery. So if we start out with a battery, we have pluses, minus, pluses, minus, minuses. So we have equilibrium. Well, when we have equilibrium, we don't have a gradient, we don't have a differential, we don't have any potential energy. What we have is a dead battery. Now, if we start, if we do something and put a whole bunch more pluses on one side than the other, that's kind of what we're doing here. We've got a gradient now. This side's much more positive. Than, than this side is. So we've got a gradient. So what we've done is we've charged the battery. You know, on a battery, we'd probably put more minuses over here. And I know a real battery has more than two cells, but for our story, it works. So what have we done? What we've done is we've caused this gradient. This gradient is potential energy. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this potential energy we're going to let all these pluses go back. So all the pluses going back is usable energy. In the case of our mitochondria, we'll use that energy to make ATP, replace the energy from, your high, from the high energy phosphate bond that we broke, make our ATP. In the battery, you know, you might be running your cell phone, your laptop, your tablet, whatever. So you're running your device, you get all these pluses over here, get back to equilibrium, no gradient anymore. That's your dead cell phone, dead laptop, whatever. So that's, that's the analogy. That's conceptually how this whole thing's working. Then we said, we're gonna take a little piece, like a little cross section of that inner mitochondrial membrane and blow it up. So we did that. And I don't remember where I put what, but we'll put the matrix up here for now. I might have put it at the bottom when we did it in class. We'll put the intermembrane space down here. And we have our complexes in here. Complex one, complex two, ubiquinone, ubiquinol or, I'm sorry, coenzyme Q. We have complex three, cytochrome C, complex four, and we have complex five. So the questions get really nicely mechanical at this point. What goes where? Well, NADH, goes into complex one. FADH2 goes into complex two. So really what I'm saying is I oxidize NADH back to NAD while I reduce complex one. And we went through what that's made up of, the flavin mononucleotide, the iron sulfur complex, all that stuff. So where does complex one send its electrons? To CoQ, as in it reduces CoQ. 
Complex 2 does also, so be careful there. Complexes 1 and 2 run parallel, not sequential. Don't let anyone trick you into saying that you go from complex 1 to complex 2. You don't. You go 1 CoQ or 2 CoQ. CoQ to 3, 3 to cytochrome C, cytochrome C to 4. Then, who contributes to the proton gradient? Well, complex 1 puts protons in the intermembrane space, as does 3, as does 4. Complex 5 allows them all to go back in. So of course, complex 5 is ATP synthase. So by them going back in, that's my energy to make my ATP. So really mechanical questions, which complexes contribute to the proton gradient? 1, 3, and 4. Which one dissipates? 5 dissipates. 2 does nothing with respect to the proton gradient. So be careful with that question. I'll hear you guys studying saying 1, 3, and 4 contribute, 5 dissipates, 2 does nothing. Then you get a question, which of the following protein complexes moves protons or moves electrons but not protons? And you get stuck on the question. 2 does nothing. So I don't know which one moves electrons and not protons. 2 moves electrons, it does nothing with respect to the proton gradient. So don't get hung up in that question. So I let all these protons back in. I can't leave them hanging around, so I've got to do something with them. They find electrons, they find oxygen. Oxygen is the ultimate electron acceptor. and they make you water. So they make you water. So if you get asked what the ultimate electron acceptor is, of course it's oxygen. What it makes you is water, so don't mix that up. Water's not accepting anything, water's the product. So don't get, don't get mixed up with that. Other names that I would make sure I knew for a couple of these complexes would be, don't forget, complex two is succinate dehydrogenase. Don't forget, complex 5 is ATP synthase. Okay, so that's our very mechanical questions. Now, let's look at the shuttles. So let's look at our point for the shuttles. Let's go back to what we did from the start. We took glucose, went to pyruvate, in the cytoplasm, pyruvate crossed into the mitochondria, made you acetyl-CoA, did Krebs, made you NADH, FADH2, all that in the mitochondria. In fact, you were in the mitochondria by the time you made the NADH and the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. You were in the cytoplasm making the NADH in glycolysis. So, I can take all of this, send it to electron transport in the mitochondria, make ATP out of it. No problem. However, here's my problem. This NADH can't get there from here. NADH cannot cross the inner mitochondrial membrane. So of course, be prepared also for questions. Here's a list of molecules, all of them but one can cross, find the cannot. All of them are in the cannot category except one, which one can. So NADH cannot cross. So I did glycolysis in the cytoplasm. I made NADH. I do electron transport in the mitochondria, and it can't get there from here. So I've got to shuttle it. So depending on where I am on the tissue level determines which shuttle I'm going to use. So depending on where I am, that determines my shuttle. So. Think about how shuttles work. We've talked about this. 
Shuttles work one of two ways. I either drop off the part that gets me stuck and keeps me from crossing the membrane, whether I'm crossing in or out, sometimes I'm going in like now, sometimes I'm going to be going out, which we'll come to. I'm either going to drop off the part of the molecule that gets me stuck and get a new one of those parts when I get in there, or I'm going to change the molecule into something I don't want, cross the membrane, and then get a new one of those parts, or turn it back to what I originally wanted in the first place. So one shuttle is the glycerophosphate shuttle or the glycerol 3 phosphate shuttle. And you'll see both, both names. So be okay with either. It's the same thing. This one takes place in the brain, skeletal muscles, places like that. So let's think about what my problem is. My problem is I have NADH. And I'm in the cytoplasm with it. Let's put my cytoplasm. I don't know. We'll put my cytoplasm up here. Put my mitochondria down here. I'm in the cytoplasm. I, I'm stuck. I'll put a nice membrane. But do I really care about the NAD part? No. I want the H. So I want the NADH, or I want the, the H part of it. Actually, let's move this. So I want the H part of it. That's where the energy is. So I'm going to take the electrons off. I'm going to lose the electrons. I'm going to oxidize it. Of course, you remember, I can't oxidize something without reducing something. I can't reduce something without oxidizing something. I'm going to put the electrons onto DHAP. When I put them onto DHAP, DHAP becomes glycerol 3 phosphate. So now these electrons are on here. It can cross in. That's kind of cool because I just got my electrons in there. But I have no place that I can put glycerol 3 phosphate into electron transport, so I'm going to oxidize it back to DHAP. DHAP can leave again. I don't care. Don't need that. I wanted the electrons. So here's my problem though. I don't have enough energy to put the electrons back on to NAD. I'm going to put them on FAD. Make myself FADH2 that will go to electron transport. Here's, here's the problem though. The other name for this, you won't see in any book, but it was just the way I remembered it when I learned it. I called it the ripoff shuttle because I put in something worth not accounting for heat, 3 ATP, and I got out something not accounting for heat worth 2 ATP. So this is like you just cashed a check at a bank with a big service charge. So we said NADH or FADH2 is like a check for ATP. It's an ATP equivalent. So you went to the bank with that NADH worth 3 ATP, and they said, no, nah, we're not giving you 3 ATP. We're giving you something worth 2. You got a big service charge there. So you get ripped off 1 ATP by having to use the shuttle because I put in a molecule worth 3, not accounting for heat, and I got one out worth 2, not accounting for heat. So that's my glycerol 3 phosphate or my glycerophosphate shuttle. And my whole point of it is getting this NADH, or really the H part, into the mitochondria so I can get ATP out of it, get it into the electron transport chain. So that's one shuttle. The other shuttle we did was the malate aspartate shuttle. Sorry, Peanut's pitching a fit. She's getting neglected, she thinks. 
Okay, so we'll put our membrane there. So I'll put my cytoplasm here. I'll put my mitochondria here. This shuttle I'm going to use on the liver, kidney, heart, places like that. And I have the same problem. I have NADH and I can't get there from here. I'm in the cytoplasm with it. But do I care about the NAD? No. I just want I want the electrons. I I care about the H part. So what I'm gonna do is not worry about the NAD part. I'm gonna take the electrons off. Well, how do I take electrons off? I've got this reaction that's losing electrons. So I'm going to oxidize NADH to NAD. So I'm going to turn it into NAD, oxidize it. I've got to reduce something. So I'm going to reduce something. Remember that reaction that you did in the Krebs cycle where malate went to oxaloacetate. That was your oxidation. While well, you reduced NAD to NADH, and you're all excited because NADH is a product of the Krebs cycle, and it's an electron carrier loaded up with electrons, and you're going to get ATP out of it, and all that cool stuff. We're going to reverse that reaction. I'm going to take oxaloacetate. I'm going to reduce it back to malate. Because malate is my membrane crosser, malate can cross. Then I'll do the Krebs reaction. I'll take it back to oxaloacetate, take NAD to NADH. That's my reduction. Goes to electron transport, makes me ATP, and I'm, I'm happy. But the glitch here is if I want to get oxaloacetate back out, I'm going to transaminate it. And when we first did this, we hadn't done transamination yet. I'm going to put an amino group on oxaloacetate. Gives me aspartate. Aspartate can come out. Then, don't forget transamination is reversible. If I want the oxaloacetate back, I can take the amino group back off and get my oxaloacetate. So the complication with this one, because it's chemistry, there's always a complication, is the little aspartate story here. What goes in is what comes out, so I'm in the same place that way. And again, my purpose is to get my NADH, or at least the reducing equivalence part, the H part of it, to get that into the mitochondria, into the electron transport chain, or into the mitochondria where it can go through the electron transport chain to make me my ATP. Okay, so let's do glycogen while this video is still running. I know the order has gotten a little dicey, but um, Vimeo is actually not letting me change, change screens midstream. So let's talk about glycogen. So we did our, oops. We did our story. Glucose went to pyruvate, went to acetyl-CoA, did Krebs, went to electron transport, went to ATP. The big assumption in this was this. I'm eating the food, the fuel I need as I need it. I'm going kind of real-time glucose to ATP. However, we know that that's not the case. I need some kind of reservoir leveling out kind of kind of a molecule. That molecule is glycogen. So we said with glycogen, there's two things you gotta think. You're gonna think it's kind of sort of a whole bunch of glucose is hooked together, because then where do you go looking if you need glucose? Glycogen. Or if you know you have extra glucose, what are you gonna do? You're gonna make glycogen. So you're going to think kind of sort of a whole bunch of glucose is together. You're also going to think quick as in short-term storage. 
And you're also going to think quick, as in, remember it's this big branched molecule. So I can be adding glucoses to the ends of all the branches at once or taking them off all at once. So the thinking quick helps you that way. It's my short-term storage because, of course, my long-term storage is fats. I'm not going to make fats until I max out my glycogen. Not a big deal there. I'm not going to break down my own fats until I empty my own glycogen. That can be a big deal in terms of weight loss and that kind of thing. So this is like my reservoir for holding, saving extra glucose. So make sure you review, and I won't do it here because it's in the long video and this is meant to be a review. Make sure you review the process, making the 1,4 bonds, the 1,6 bonds, breaking them, what enzyme, all that. We're going to go through the application -y part of it. So we're going to look at two processes, glycogenesis, and I know it was very difficult to write in class this part, so glycogenolysis. So when am I going to do each one? Well, I'm going to do glycogenesis when I have extra glucose. I'm going to make, make glycogen, generate glycogen. I'm going to do glycogenolysis as in break down glycogen when I need glucose. So I store glycogen in the liver and in the muscle. So let's think about, I don't know, let's do the liver first. When am I going to have extra glucose? I'm going to have extra glucose when I'm well fed. And that's the term you typically see. I'm going to need glucose when I'm fasting. Be very, very careful of that word. All fasting means in biochemistry and in the context of glucose and glycogen is this. I haven't eaten in sufficient enough time that my blood glucose levels have started to drop. Forget about your three-day, five-day, whatever water fast. Forget about your intermittent, you know, I'm doing 18-6 intermittent fasting. Forget all that. You're not on a hunger strike either. You just haven't eaten in sufficient amount of time that your blood glucose levels have been allowed to drop. In the muscle, I have extra glucose when I'm at rest. In the muscle, I need glucose when I'm exercising. So those are a little more apparent. Then what enzymes are in the picture? Glycogen synthase is my big player for making glycogen or doing glycogenesis. Glycogen phosphorylase is my big player for breaking down glycogen, giving me glucose. What about hormones? When I'm making glycogen, the hormone that's active is insulin. Insulin's a big, big player, so I'd make sure I was very familiar with insulin. When I'm breaking down glycogen, my hormones are different. I've got glucagon doing it in the liver, I've got epinephrine doing it in the muscle. The epi is going to be a fight or flight kind of story. And of course the glucagon is going to be I didn't eat kind of story. So lots and lots and lots of very application based questions can come from this. Really easy to do it. Insulin's active. What am I doing? You know, glycogenesis or glycogenolysis? I'm doing glycogenesis. Insulin's active. Did I eat or not eat? Well, I'm well fed. I ate. Glucagon's active. What enzyme is it going to fire up? Glycogen phosphorylase and so on. So really easy to get some nice multiple choice questions here by kind of giving you two things and you have to 
pick the third. So make sure you go through that and you're pretty, pretty solid on that. Okay, I'm going to stop here because I need to change the screen for gluconeogenesis. So then we'll do gluconeogenesis and that'll be it for the re review for now.